And here we go. Chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are in the world. This is Lon Seidman, and we are here for NSF Live. We've got a lot of stuff to cover over the next 90 minutes or so. I'm Lon Seidman here, and I'm joined by Alex Romera and Trevor Sesnick, who will be answering all of my questions and all of your questions today. Alex, how you doing out there? Well, I'm doing well. I'm, you know... It's, it's a bit chilly today here, but definitely going to be a very interesting uh, start of the week tomorrow because we have another double header. <laughs> That's right. One of them involving a Falcon Heavy, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. And Trevor's joining us too. Trevor, how's it going with you? Yeah, doing great. Thanks for having me on. Great. Well, we have a lot of stuff to cover today, so i got to go through my list here. We've got the, the Chinese Sukui. I believe that's how we pronounce it. Uh, the second of those launch vehicles has flown again. I guess maybe that might be the third one. Uh, and there's another one that is due to go and might hop. We're going to discuss that. Um, we also have that double header we were talking about, which involves a Starlink mission, but also a very interesting Falcon Heavy mission involving a little mini space shuttle that's going up on a SpaceX rocket for the first time. We'll give you some more details there, at least the details that we can know without the uh, government silencing us, because this is a top secret mission. Uh, Europe lost some tanks for Vega, and we're also going to look at the year in numbers, because SpaceX might hit 100 launches by the end of this year, but this is probably the most busy uh, year for human launches in a very long time. And then, of course, we have our favorite topic, which is Starship and when it might launch again. So we've got a full docket here. But first, I'm going to kick it over to you, Alex. What's going on with the Chinese launch system here? It looks like they've got kind of a Falcon 9 alternative or competitor that might actually return to the launch site, very similar to what our SpaceX rockets do. What do you know about it? Yeah, so I guess we'll start from the top, right? Uh, we had the, the, the third launch of the Suka-2 vehicle, the Suka-2 rocket from Landspace in China. And that was the first rocket, the first Methalux rocket to reach orbit overall across the world. It tried a first attempt, I think it was in December 14th, 2022. Uh, it didn't succeed. It basically failed during the second stage of flight. But then they tried again uh, earlier this year and they were able to launch. I think that's not the correct rocket though. <laughs> 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 and so uh, they tried to to launch again and they were able to succeed on that second flight. There you go. This, this, that's that's the, the clips of that of that launch. Uh, I think this is the third launch though. Yeah, because it has the... So this third launch, it was the first time it carried a payload. And actually, the funny thing is it actually also carried like stickers from a toy company or something like it on the on the first stage of the rocket. But definitely a very interesting rocket is all Methalox, both the first and second stages. It's kind of like as if you took the Zhongzhan uh, 2D rocket, I think it is, and then you made it Methalox, kind of like that. But anyways, um, that rocket is a smaller rocket, though, than, than Starship and Vulcan and all of those uh, other Methalox rockets that have tried to reach orbit this year. We have had Terran 1 in, in March, which also failed during the second stage of flight. Then Vulcan, we knew today that it has been uh, delayed to at least no earlier than January 8th of next year. So that's going to be 2024. And then Starship also flew two times and, well, kind of almost got there. It also failed on the second stage of flight last time. We'll see next, uh, you know, towards the end of the show, we'll talk about that. But definitely very, very interesting. And now this rocket, 
Uh, it's going to fly more times, but this company, Landspace, is already preparing for a larger rocket. It's called the Zuka 3 vehicle. That one is going to be reusable instead of you know, expendable like this one. You can see there the, the sticker of Pop Mart, uh, some kind of toy company there in China. <laughs> so that that uh, larger rocket is closer to Falcon 9 in terms of performance that you can see uh, a render of how that will look like. It's basically about, I think it's somewhere around 70 meters tall, just like Falcon 9, but it is wider and it's also using Methalox, just like the Zuka 2. Falcon 9 obviously uses uh, Carolox, as everybody knows. And then it will be able to put, uh, there you go, 76.6 meters tall and 4.5 meters in diameter. This is the, the Tanka uh, 12B uh, engine, which will use nine of them. And it's about one mega newton of thrust for a total of nine mega newtons of thrust at liftoff. It is also reusable, use Eleni legs and grid fins and everything, just like we see with Falcon 9. You're going to really reinvent the wheel, right? With that, with, with the first stage re, uh, reuse is kind of like obvious how it should look like. But then <clears throat> this rocket is, uh, as you can see there, they're already looking at the, at the future of launching mega constellations. It's tailored precisely to launch these mega constellations. And one of the things that we're going to see really, really soon, or they at least promise that, is going to be a, a test of this first stage booster, like a hop test. Basically, it'll be just launching and landing nearby it's going to be like grasshopper like a star hopper as well more like a star hopper because it's going to be using uh methalox but actually this is the funny thing it is not the only methalox rocket doing hops at jiquan because the place that this is going to be launching from is going to be the jiquan satellite launch center in china there's another rocket by by a company called iSpace that is also creating a reusable methalox rocket and it has already done two hops with a suborbital demonstrator it's like a little mini hopper as well. It's called Hyperbola 2. And then they're going to be doing the Hyperbola 3 rocket, which is also reusable and Methalox. You know, Methalox is now, there you can see that test. That actually happened yesterday or today or something like that. I think it was today, early today. So it was right after that launch of the Suka 2 rocket. And you can see it lifts off, it lands, you know, just little steps to get to the point of, you know, launching the big rocket. Uh, it's actually not that big. The the, per, uh, the Hyperbola uh, 3 rocket is not that that big, but it's still reusable and also trying to do propulsive landing. But definitely the way to go. I think that that's a really neat thing to do in, in terms of how to actually reuse uh, vehicles, in my opinion, at least. And we'll see how that gets them, uh, where they end up with. And, and it certainly looks very familiar, but I guess it's probably because we've seen <laughs> so many Falcons launch that although you could, of course, talk about industrial espionage or whatever. I mean, the reality is I think yeah. just by observing, you can probably get a feel for how, how this works, right? Yeah, and the interesting thing is that uh, I saw a lot of people, for example, on Twitter when they did the first, uh, the first test of this uh, Hyperbola 2 rocket uh, that they were calling sp spionage or something like that. They're, they're spying on SpaceX because they're trying. We just lost Alex there. We'll keep yeah. going. So Trevor, let me bring you in real quick because um, we'll have uh, Alex continue his thoughts when he comes back. Um, methane is becoming, it, it seems like it's now the fuel for the entire industry across the globe. Why do you think that is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, we, as you said, we were seeing basically everyone switch to it. SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, ULA, a bunch of these Chinese vehicles, Relativity. And that the reason for that is kind of a in a good Goldilocks zone between ISP and total thrust. So if you look at something like RP-1, uh, that has a fairly low ISP, but also very high amounts of thrust. And then on the other ISP side is what? of uh, specific impulse, good question. So that's okay. a, um, basically a measure of how efficient the rocket engine is. It's a measure of how long can it uh, burn at one G for more or less. Um, so it's, uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have hydrogen, which has a very, very high specific impulse. It's very efficient, but it doesn't produce that much thrust. So methane is kind of in this in the middle where you get a lot of thrust out of it, but also a pretty high specific impulse. So it's efficient, has lots of thrust to reduce uh, gravity drag. Um, so it's this, it's just a Goldilocks zone and it's uh, fairly easy to work with compared to uh, hydrogen as well. And why do you think it took so long for the industry to shift over if this fuel was so good? Was, was there technological and, and engineering hurdles to kind of overcome with that? 
Um, yeah, I know there are some. So first of all, I don't think it's completely novel. If I remember correctly, uh, the Soviet Union actually worked a little bit with methane engines, um, but they never had one leave the test stand. And I could be wrong about that. My Soviet engine history is uh, not the best. Um, but uh, there are some things that are a little bit harder with it. So first of all, it's another cryogenic propellant, uh, which is nothing different than if you're using hydrogen, but it is harder in that sense uh, compared to RP-1, since now you need to load two cryogenic propellants uh, and you know you need all of the uh, cryogenic valves and cryogenic um, insulation and whatnot. Uh, and then the other thing is it makes it a little bit more difficult in the engine. Uh, I believe it has some somewhat weird burn properties compared to hydrogen and RP-1 that made it a little bit more complex, but I don't think those were the reasons why it took so long to switch to it. And so, and really pretty much every rocket that we'll be looking at in the very near future will be uh, methane based. And it looks like Alex, we got you back now, I think. Camera is not working for some reason. Oh. Well, you know what, while, uh, well, while you try to get your camera working, you were mid-thought about the similarity between what China is producing here and the SpaceX rockets. I want you to finish that thought if you can. Yeah, I bet you probably have been talking about how it really isn't that like, um, it's similar, but then the engine cycle, for example, is not the same while it uses methalogs. It is not the same uh, cycle of the engine. It doesn't use the same kind of, uh, how to say, uh, technology in general. The performance is the same, but there's also many other uh, United States companies, you know, uh, in America that are also using the same kind of performance numbers, like the Neutron rocket. You also have Terran R and things like that. They are American, right? And they're also using Methalox and they're also using propulsive landing. So at the end of the day, I don't think it's down to espionage. It's just that they see what, what works and what doesn't. And so they're trying to, to imitate what works. And I think that's the smart move, because I think if you know what works, why not copy it, right? If, if it works, it works. Just don't try to reinvent the wheel. Makes sense. Right, and I th it does make sense. And I think back, Trevor, to like the Buran space shuttle, which, which looked a lot like the NASA space shuttle, but was very different in some ways as well, right? You see what, obviously what you can observe and, and engineer from that, but also uh, developing something new and novel. And clearly the uh, the engineering of this this rocket, at least in so far as how it operates, including the fuel that it uses, is is certainly very different. But I have no doubt what they observed from SpaceX's successful, uh, many successful landings of boosters. There seems to be some things that work pretty well, and if you can replicate that, you may as well just do it. Um, and I don't know if there's any uh, patent issues with that or not. But uh, Trevor, you heard anything from the space community about the similarities here? Is there concerns? Um, people crying foul, or is it just uh, fair game? I mean, I think uh, in the space community, people always accuse uh, people from looking at one another's homework, if you will. Uh, but like mm -hmm. Alex was saying, I think to some extent, why wouldn't you? Um, like even with this video that we see on screen right now, right? This is a very similar test program to uh, what SpaceX did with Falcon 9 with Grasshopper and then Falcon 9 uh, R, the development vehicles that they flew in McGregor. And you may think, well, why does it look so similar? And the answer to that is just, well, it's kind of the way that you test these things. And, um, you know, physics points you to a design solution, uh, which for partially reusable rockets seems to point you to basically the Falcon 9. Uh, and then from there, you know, you follow physics and you end up with a vehicle that looks pretty similar to Falcon 9. And we see the same thing with fully reusable rockets where, you know, all of the fully reusable rockets that have been announced with the exception of Stoke look more or less like what we see Starship uh, looks like. So I think, um, you know, the two uh, things that to keep in mind is, first of all, physics always wins and you can't get around physics. And second of all, even if they are directly copying SpaceX, why wouldn't they? Falcon 9 is by far the market leader right now. Uh, so like, why try to invent something new when you could you know, make a Falcon 9 type vehicle and then launch that a bunch and then later innovate on that if you still need to. Yeah, right. then and also, it... oh, I, uh, I was going to say that I will also argue that people that say, oh, it looks the same as the Falcon 9. It's like, if you look back at how Falcon 9 started, it also looked like Antares. So it's like <laughs> every yeah. rocket kind of looks like every other rocket. I think the only 
unique rockets are probably the upcoming Neutron, and then you have Starship, which also looks like sort of unique. But then again, if you look at the booster, if you, if you had the super heavy booster without the grid fins and the chines, you will probably have something that resembles more like an enlarged Atlas booster. Uh, not the Atlas V, but I mean the, the old Atlas that was also stainless steel and all of the rings. It also looked pretty much the same as you will see now, uh, the super heavy. So just like you just add grid fins and chines and things like that to be able to control the whole thing during the way down. That's pretty much what they're doing. Like they're just taking a rocket and putting grid fins and landing legs. And I don't think there's anything revolutionary on that because um, you kind of need a landing leg sort of, right? Uh, you, you need some kind of design for touching down on the ground and be able to, to stand up. And then you need something to control aerodynamically. You could also use fins. Uh, Neutron will use fins. New Shepard and New Glenn also uses use fins. So like, okay, whatever whatever you can use, but at the end of the day, you kind of need some kind of aerodynamic control during the re-entry. And so it's either grid fins or normal fins. There's, every there's plane not has a, lot a wing. Of, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. And then you have the shuttle, which is, which is also like a wing uh, kind of design. And as you say, every plane has a wing. Oh my gosh, there's a Boeing <laughs> here and, a, and an Airbus, and an Airbus uh, right? there. Yeah. And they have wings. They are copying. And no, it's just, it's just the design. It's just what, what it tells you, right? It's like yeah. and when you do we the see physics. Similar, like we see similar things in tech as well, where, you know, basically someone will release a new feature on a phone generally. You know, uh, you know, I think the saying mm. is whether it's true or not is, you know, everyone copies Apple a, f a few years later, a little bit worse. And so you always kind of have this one market leader that everyone uh, looks at their homework and is like, I like these things, but I'm going to make these changes uh, to make the device a little bit better for this group of people or whatever. And before we move on, I did like... have one question related to this. I, I just want to bring this one up. I, yeah, yeah. I don't want you can handle this because when I have visited um, a couple of different space facilities, um, even as a member of the media, where you think you have total freedom to do whatever you want as a member of the press, I hear this word ITAR. Don't take pictures of the rocket plumbing, right? Those sorts of things. So um, maybe Alex, I, I know you're a resident uh, regulation expert here. Um, how does ITAR you know, fall into this? Because clearly the engines they're using are very different than SpaceX. They could observe the grid fins and the landing legs and the shape of the rocket, um, but ITAR would prevent them from, or make it more difficult for them to get actual engine photographs to replicate that, right? Yeah, and, and there's also the fact that, um, I, I mean, I'm not a, an expert regulation or anything like it, and it's actually American regulation. <laughs> you are in the FAA, know I know that it. much about you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I know, for example, that uh, at the end of the day, the technology that is covered in, in ITAR is mostly about injectors and things like that. That is mostly the stuff that is, because I, I mean, I, I haven't really been to any American rocket, but I, I've been at least next to a, a European rocket, and the first thing that they do is cover the injector. And so um, the the multiple things that you could be able to to work if you actually work out the injector, because the, the rest of the engine, maybe the turbo machinery is a bit more complicated, but the injector and how to be able to mix all of those com uh, you know combustion um, propellants uh, Put together in into the combustion chamber that is very complicated to do without exploding the engine and so if you if you give that to your to your opponents that's not a really good thing if you really want to avoid that but then there's also uh you know proprietary concerns companies are always trying to hide their own proprietary stuff with multiple sorts of ways we know that at least for raptor we've seen a lot of components but elon has said many many times if you want to try copying our design, sure, go ahead, because it's really darn complicated to copy it, right? It's, it's like, uh, good for you. If you copy it, <laughs> if you are able to copy the, the design just from pictures and things like that, you, you're already darn good at, at, at you know, engineering. No, it I takes think, a, a really good job to do that. Yeah, I think that also ITAR has kind of lost scope a little bit, right? ITAR stands for International Traffic in Arms Regulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, what this was originally meant is that we don't share weapon designs and whatnot with other countries, and you try to make that limited to American citizens uh, that are able to view those. And 
I feel like now it's just kind of used as a bit of an excuse, like with SLS when um, they wouldn't share parts of the fueling sequence because of ITAR. And it's just kind of like nonsensical because none of SLS's technology would even be good for <laughs> weapons. Like, can you if imagine? <laughs> if you want to yeah. launch a missile at someone, you don't want to be like, oh, let's fuel this up, which takes like eight hours. Oh, right. and then we have problems <laughs> no, with it's hydrogen. <laughs> so we need to go send someone to the pad to fix the hydrogen leak. And then now, finally, 12 hours later, we can launch our missile. No, you use <laughs> like hyperbolics or solids or something like that. So I feel like a lot of ITAR has kind of lost scope. And it's now more proprietary concerns like Alex yeah. was saying compared to this ITAR, which is I don't know. I think it's overused, to be honest. But it would be one big missile, that's for sure, right? <laughs> now, nowadays, yeah. companies just throw, you know, oh, no, this is ITAR, and it's actually proprietary. It's not ITAR. But they like to, to do that just because it's like a way to sort of hide that they're doing proprietary stuff that they don't want to show. But, but right. it's sort of like that. And on the note of, like, you know, copying designs and things like that, Dream Chaser, for example, it's original design comes from the Russians. So it's like, is that copying as well? <laughs> anyway, well, that's, a, that's a whole debate. <laughs> that's a whole debate, exactly. And then, uh, then Ryan in our back channel here says, the missile launch is delayed because of that ethernet switch. Remember that one? <laughs> so oh you my have God. a whole bunch of stuff going on there. Well, speaking of, of the Dream Chaser, we have another little mini space shuttle going up in a couple of, tomorrow actually, as a matter of fact. And this is a pretty much a secret military vehicle that has flown multiple times, the X-37B. It's been in orbit uh, for very long missions, some of them lasting over two years. And tomorrow, it's going up on Falcon Heavy for the first time. And Trevor, what can you tell us about this mission? This is an interesting one. Yeah, it's a super interesting mission. So as you said, this was the X-37B space vehicle, and that's a vehicle that's operated by the United States Space Force um, that was built by Boeing. Um, and tomorrow it is being launched atop Falcon Heavy on the USSF 52 mission. Um, launch is currently 8.14 p.m. Eastern Time uh, with the boosters B-1064-5 and B-1065-5 landing on LZ-1 and LZ-2 respectively. Uh, the center core B-1084 uh, will be expended. Um, this will be its first and only flight. Um, this was a the first actually competitive award that Falcon Heavy won. Um, it beat ULA's Delta IV Heavy uh, with SpaceX winning $130 million for this launch. Um, so I guess what are some of the interesting things about this mission? As we said, it's the X-37B, which has, as you were alluding to, had some very long periods of time on orbit. I believe the OTV-6 mission, uh, which was the X-37B, but it was the other vehicles. So they have two of these tails. This is tail two, uh, and tail one is the one with the record so far. It was on orbit for 906 days before uh, re-entering. So almost three years, which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, we're not 100% sure what the vehicle does on orbit. We know it's done some testing, like some um, ion thrusters on the mission launching tomorrow. There's a SEEDS mission from NASA, which is where they're going to um, have a bunch of plant seeds just be in space for a long time with under that radiation to see what uh, DNA changes are made to them. Um, and then we've also known that some small satellites have been deployed from the platform. So we're not 100% sure what else it does because as Lon was saying, it is a classified mission. Um, but yeah, it's a very cool spacecraft. Uh, then that's not the only um, thing that's launched that's happening tomorrow from SpaceX. Uh, a little bit later in the day, about uh, just under three hours later, they are launching yet another Starlink mission. The Starlink Group 6-34 mission will be launching 23 Starlink satellites into a low Earth orbit. Uh, we don't have too much information on that yet, like with booster or not. Uh, but as Alex is pointing out, we'll see a similar shot of a Falcon 9 at slick uh, 40 and then a 30, uh, a Falcon Heavy launching from 39A. Um, that's what yeah, Alex's they're, background is today. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not showing it yet, but I'm pointing at it. <laughs> <laughs> there, <laughs> there we, we go. go. <laughs> there go. This, was, this was the last Falcon Heavy mission. This was Psyche, and then this was a Starlink uh, 622, if I'm correct. N not wrong. Hold on. 
I think it was yeah, I think it was six twenty two. So yeah, we had we had another time, uh last time a Falcon Heavy flew where it flew and then a few hours later they launched a Starlink. So it's gonna be repeated again. I guess that's what we're gonna be expecting in the near future. And yeah. and you know what what strikes me about this mission too is that this space plane has not flown or been orbiting at the altitude that they plan to get it to here. And Trevor, the fact that they are expending the center core suggests that they're really trying to get it as high as they can. Yeah, uh, so the exact orbit that it's going into is sadly classified. So we don't know exactly what it is at this point, but we know from the notice to Mariners that it's going into a higher inclination orbit. I believe I saw on the order of 47 degrees or something like that. Um, Probably higher. Yeah, it could be a little bit higher uh, with a dog leg as well. Um, so it's going into some high inclination orbit. Uh, so then it kind of gets us wondering, like, what are some high energy, high inclination orbits? Uh, and those are all probably going to be like highly elliptical. Uh, but we're not entirely sure exactly why it's going into such an orbit uh, or exactly what the orbit it's going to. But this is the by far the most powerful vehicle that the space plane will ever launch on. Um, so it's previously launched on the Falcon 9 once and then on the Atlas V 501, if I remember correctly. So a fairly, uh, you know, baseline Atlas V. So it's obviously going to have way more energy this time. So it's a matter of what exactly are they wanting to test? And we sadly don't know. Yeah. And, and, and if, also... we did, if we did ever find out, they'd kill us. So, you know, that, that <laughs> Go ahead, Alex, sorry. Yeah, I, I was going to say that, that we also have the, the fact that, um, you know, one, one of the things that, that, really, that I've seen people trying to come up with, where is it going? Because we have the hazard zones for the launch and also the re-entry. And the re-entry is showing that it's going to be somewhere, like at least the, the inclination of the orbit for it to match the re-entry of the second stage will have to be somewhere around 60 to 70 degrees of inclination. And then because it is a Falcon Heavy, we know that it has to be some kind of elliptical orbit at that inclination. And that has actually a name that is usually called a Molnia orbit. So these Molnia orbits are precisely called be because of the Molnia satellites from the Soviets that, um, that basically launched these, they were basically communication, communication satellites that they launched in highly elliptical and highly inclined orbits where, you know, the, the apogee was going to be positioned right above Russia. So in, in those orbits, you're probably somewhere around like, like on a, on a, on an orbital period of about 12 hours. And so during the apogee, it stays, it stays a long time in the apogee because it's re really highly in, Highly, highly elliptical, and so you have an, uh, uh, an orbit here with uh, with one of these satellites, and then another satellite here, and then another satellite here, and at the end of the day, when, once you have three or four of them uh, in these twelve hour uh, orbits, then you you are able to have complete coverage of Russia all over the day, and so that's why they're called Molnia because the the Russians, the Soviets, actually they had this kind of constellation, and I think they still have these sort of satellites. The, the uh, United States joined in that and then eventually had uh, a similar kind of system where they have these sort of satellites in similar orbits. My bet is that it's going to be that kind of orbit. Yeah, so I think one thing that we may be useful to explain is so when you're at a lower inclination, uh, like over the equator, even like up to, I don't know, 20 degrees or so, maybe a bit more, uh, mm -hmm. you don't need these types of orbits because you can have just your satellite be in geostationary orbit, which is where It'll roughly stay constantly above you at all times. But when you're really far either north or south, you're not able to go into those types of orbits for your communication satellites since geostationary orbit doesn't exist there. That's only around the equator. Um, so that's why they came up with a slightly different orbit where you have this really elliptical orbit so that it stays at the top for a long time and then rapidly gets back there. So then you have two of those satellites allowing you to have a constant communication at higher mm -hmm. latitudes which geostationary satellites couldn't give you. And I see from the yeah. photo that we have up on screen right now that it looks as though this has some, some hypergolics on there, which means that it obviously is maneuverable because first of all, it can come back to Earth at some point, uh, but I would imagine it also probably changes its orbit slightly too. Yeah, and yeah. it also has, oh, go ahead. No, you can go ahead. 
Well, I was I was gonna say that in the last mission it got a service module, so now it has more capability to maneuver and also carry uh, different sorts of payloads on that uh, service module. We don't really know how many payloads and how weird uh, kind of the payloads are, uh, but that was an improvement, uh, an upgrade sort of thing uh, for the last mission. This mission also uh, includes a service module, so definitely could go places where. We don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. And Trevor, there is kind of like an like, a, like an amateur sport trying to track this thing because people you can observe it, right? If you have the right equipment. Yeah, that's what I was actually just looking for uh, on Twitter. Is in the past we've seen fairly significant uh, orbital changes that it's done post launch um, using those thrusters that we've been talking about. And I know those such as uh, Jonathan McDowell have um, very have. Well, Jonathan McDowell does a good job of everything, but he's done a great job keeping track of uh, some of the orbits that it's been to before. Um, so I was just looking and uh, I can't, I, I know I've seen a tweet before about some of the changes done in orbit where you could try to estimate how much Delta V does the vehicle have itself. Uh, but unfortunately, I wasn't prepared and I cannot find the tweet. That's okay. I mean, it's certainly a, a, a fun topic because, you know, for a lot of, obviously for NASA launches and even for SpaceX launches to a large degree, we know a lot, right? Because it's all you know, mostly a NASA mission or some kind of public thing going on. This is so buttoned up that we have no idea what's in it. The only thing that we know is on it really is that NASA seed experiment, Alex, right? Where they're going to be mm. testing some radiation. But I, don't, I can't even think of a time when there may have been a NASA um, mission on one of these things. I think there's been at some point in the past a couple of payloads on the X-37B, but I'm not fully sure. I, I I sort of kind of remember that there has been some some other payloads on board that at least they have been able to talk about. Um, but again, not fully sure which ones they were. I do right. know because um, there's a lot of people asking. Well, couldn't, couldn't Falcon 9 still launch this vehicle into that kind of orbit? And one of the things that um, we also saw with this Falcon Heavy, because um, it's a highly elliptical uh, and highly inclined orbit and everything like that, right? But it doesn't have the long coast uh, phase uh, kit. It basically is the, the whole um, gray bar on the RP-1 tank of the second stage that basically allows it to be able... It's a couple of more things like extended battery life and things like that but um overall that sort of gray band gives you the opportunity to be able to to do co uh, long coast phases because you are in you're basically in space and you need to manage the temperature of not only the liquid oxygen but also the kerosene the kerosene freezes the liquid oxygen boils and so it's bit of a, of a pain to regulate all of that and so with that gray paint they are able to better regulate the 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 RP-1, the kerosene on the second stage, uh, the temperatures and everything. <clears throat> and so it is important to, to notice that this rocket doesn't have that. And so if it's going up there, it's probably because all of those inclination changes, for example, are being done closer to the Earth. And if it's that the case, because if it's closer to the Earth because of how orbital mechanics works, the times between burns could be shorter and therefore you don't need a higher... Uh, you know, you don't need to do things way out there and therefore a long coast phase for the second stage, in which case it means that it probably is expending a lot of delta V in changing those orbits very close to, to the Earth. That actually is very inefficient, so to speak. And so that's why probably they need that Falcon Heavy, not only because it is the, the X-37V, et cetera, right? It's, it's about seven tons or something like that, maybe more with a, with a service module. But you also are doing this sort of uh, inefficient maneuvers way closer to the Earth instead of doing them at the utmost uh, efficiency. So that's why you need the extra performance from Falcon Heavy in order to carry that out. That's my guess, at least. <laughs> and speaking of Falcon Heavy, we have some footage of a static fire that was done the other day. Um, we don't always see them do a static fire, perhaps for some of these Starlink missions, but military missions like this in particular, most definitely. And while we're watching that, maybe Trevor can handle this question from Kanan uh, Copeland. I was wondering, why are they using a brand new booster for the center core? Wouldn't it be better to use an old core at the end of its life cycle and get rid of it that way? Yeah, so the answer to that is they don't have any other center cores, right? The center core is different from the Falcon 9. 
Um, so the Falcon 9 can be transferred between a Falcon Heavy side booster and a normal Falcon 9. Uh, but that's not the case with the center core. Since the center core has a lot more uh, forces through it, because you have the two side cores on both sides, um, it's been reinforced throughout the entire thing. Uh, the inner stage is, is different. And then you also have the um, uh, latches that hold on to uh, both side boosters. So because of all of that, uh, it needs to be a different design. And that's actually what kind of made Falcon Heavy, or one of the things that made Falcon Heavy take so long to develop. Um, so, and they have not yet successfully recovered a Falcon Heavy center core. They landed one once on the Arab Set 6A mission, uh, but then it tipped over uh, in the ocean. Hmm. Uh, so hmm. they don't have any other ones to use, so it has to be a new booster. And so it is a very, so even though it's a Falcon 9 at heart, engineering wise, it's very different. Although, uh, Alex, the two boosters on the side can be Falcon 9s, right? Yeah, they have actually done the conversion back and forth between Falcon Heavy side booster and Falcon 9 booster and then back to Falcon Heavy. Uh, we saw that with B-1052, it flew two missions as a Falcon Heavy side booster, then it flew a bunch of other missions as Falcon 9 booster, and then it returned back to Falcon Heavy side booster for the Viasat 3 mission earlier this year. So we have plenty of, of examples of side boosters going back and forth, but the Seracore, as uh, Trevor mentioned, it cannot be, um, you basically cannot use a, a Falcon 9 booster and use it as a center core. I guess you could probably use a Falcon Heavy center core with a few modifications as a, as a regular Falcon 9, but that will not be very optimal. I think that, uh, yeah, because it's, it's heavier, so you probably, right. it's not useful. Right, if you reuse them, you'll make them into another center core Falcon Heavy mission, but otherwise you'll ditch it in the ocean, especially when your customer is pretty, Pretty loaded, I think, as you can say, the U.S. <laughs> government can afford to, uh, you know, buy a booster and, you know, just toss it in the ocean because they need to get as much velocity as they can. And before we move on to the next topic, I do want to acknowledge some Super Chats and supporters. We have R.C. Horseman, who has contributed five Red Team memberships. So thank you all. Uh, thank you to, uh, sorry, R.C. Horseman, and congratulations to everyone who got a membership from him. Uh, Paul482 gifted a, uh, became a PadRat member. Thank you very much for that. R.C. Horseman then gave another five memberships. So we have a bunch of new members today, courtesy of R.C. Horseman. Uh, Jim Cavett uh, also contributed one Red Team membership. And Trevor, here's a question for you from Musical Wolves. Uh, does SpaceX launch Starlinks right after other missions to celebrate other missions successfully launching? I doubt that, but I would imagine they, they do need to clear those Starlinks out of the warehouse at some point. Too. <laughs> um... So yeah, I mean, normally we see a Starlink mission after these Falcon Heavy launches, and that's kind of for two reasons. First of all, SpaceX's launch cadence is just so high that there's a Starlink mission from uh, Pad 40 every four to five days. So, you know, if you have a Falcon Heavy on the pad, it's generally on the pad and ready since they do static fires for more than four to five days. So you'll probably have several Falcon 9s go during that time. Um, but the other big mission, and this is a rule that we know is true with NASA, and we suspect is true with the United States Space Force, is on these really high, uh, really important missions, such as crewed missions, uh, big NASA payloads, and we suspect these uh, classified missions, there's a rule where SpaceX is not allowed to launch within 24 hours, or sometimes a little bit more, ahead of uh, these big missions. So what that means uh, is Right, we saw today that Falcon Heavy got delayed to tomorrow, and then the Starlink mission also got pushed back to tomorrow. So we suspect again that that's because of the United States Space Force's rule, but that's not confirmed. Uh, but I think that's often why after Falcon Heavy missions, there's immediately a Starlink mission because then SpaceX is allowed to launch it. You want to keep them focused on on uh, the big customer here, obviously, which is uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a. I think the rule is a little bit silly. I think it makes sense for some of the legacy uh, launch providers that launch several times a year. But when you have a team like SpaceX that have proven that they're able to launch every few days and launch missions with just hours apart, to me, it kind of seems like, well, why does this rule still apply? Uh, so I'll be curious to see if SpaceX works with them at all to try to get rid of this rule. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on that and see what happens, right? Because SpaceX is certainly launching much more frequently and, you know, Alex, one thing I was thinking about here, too, though, is that let's say, you know, we don't want this to happen. But let's say out of one of the three places that SpaceX launches their rockets, we have an anomaly that 
causes um, some damage or we lose a vehicle, that would stop everything, wouldn't it? Because they have to figure out if there's something wrong with the Falcon 9 system. Yeah, they, they will probably stand down and be, you know, figuring out what happened with a with a launch. Um, I'm I'm mostly sure that the that the thing that they are looking for with that sort of rule is not when something big happens, but when something small happens, and you kind of have to go through the data carefully and actually look, you know, and and find out that little thing. Because um, sometimes it might be, you know, in in the first reviews, it might not be um that noticeable then you look through and you're like mm, there was this little thing that you know it wasn't a, a huge deal because we have these other things going on that kind of prevent any major thing happening but that little thing we, we need to fix that for the next launch because these uh these government customers usually are a little bit picky with their with their missions and so they're like eh, we need you to fix that little thing and so that's why they do this and 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 usually it's not just that they, the, the SpaceX engineers review the data, it's also that their own engineers review the data. Uh, both uh, the US Space Force and also NASA goes in and, and sort of goes hand in hand with these missions and, and try to get an understanding of, of what is the status of these missions going forward. So I think that's probably the, the, the case here. And I understand that, but also as, as Trevor said, it is also true that most of the time, because there are all of these other things going on uh, that kind of protect the whole uh, mission from, from going astray, I, I think it's probably not that big of a deal. I understand with, with, a, with a mission like this, maybe, but there's other missions where these sort of rules could be loosened a bit. Well, you know what doesn't get loosened up around here is the fact that when you become a member of the NASA spaceflight community, the NSF community, you get a lot of benefits associated with that. And if you were just gifted a membership, I hope first of all, you thank those who have gifted you the membership, um, but you do get quite a bit because we do offer a lot of free things to anybody. Um, but Alex, there's a couple of things that you get be above and beyond, right? If you become a member. Yeah, and so um, <laughs> we're not throwing <laughs> to the correct one. There we go. <laughs> there we go. So we have all of these level of memberships where you have pad rat membership. You basically are highlighted in the chat. You get your custom emojis. You can also have access to the 4K multi view when we do these Starbase events as we normally do. Then our red team and above, you get uh, exclusive of YouTube photos and, and videos. Capcom, you have access to the Discord uh, server. You also have. Um, a lot more photos in the Discord uh, server as well. We, we, we have a lot more things going on there as well. Then launch directors, you get the name of the uh, on, on the show on NSF Live here at the end. And then also flight engineers, like the everything, mm, sup, like the, the, the highest level of support that you can give us. And that that all, not only gets you everything else, but also our, our most uh, support and, and, and love, because that's really very, very, Appreciate it. And as you can see there, launch directors, we, we're going to need to hand you out some, some glasses because those you'll see later at the end of the show that the, the letters are really, really small in the font. We need to, to <laughs> up that, that size. But definitely uh, consider to you know, be a member because everything that you see here, everything that we do at the end of the day is, is thanks to your support and definitely very, very appreciate it. And we do appreciate it because this is a community-driven a publication essentially, both on, on the web with nasaspaceflight.com, but also uh, the YouTube channel here. And it's all because of all of you. And I want to thank a couple people who became members while Alex was chatting here. Uh, so Future Space Tourist became a red team member. And hopefully you'll take some cool Ooh. pictures for us that we can share with the community. Uh, Coco Katz uh, be, uh, gifted a red team membership. And Methane Man, a, an appropriate uh, name given what we were just discussing about methane fuel on rockets, has gifted five red team memberships. So a bunch of new people uh, have joined the ranks here today, courtesy of the generosity of others. So thank you all for your support of our efforts here. Now, our next topic is, this one's kind of crazy. So here's the topic. <laughs> Europe lost some tanks for Vega, if you can believe that. Um, apparently, and I'll turn this over to Trevor to talk more about this, but as I was reading about this story, it kind of reminds me of what happens in my house every morning. So. I make my morning coffee, I do my, you know, my computer stuff in the morning, catch up on stuff, 
And sometimes I put my coffee cup down and my wife just takes it away and throws it in the sink because she thinks I'm done with it. But I'm like, not done, right? Um, this kind of sounds like the same thing, Trevor. What happened there? Are they a little too efficient in their cleaning up of the facility? Yeah. Uh, the European space market right now, and this is kind of something we'll get into in a bit, is ha it's having some rough times if Alex's facial expressions uh, throughout <laughs> this have not been enough. I am... Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so this week we got the news that Europe just lost some tanks for Vega. So they have this company, Avo, I think is the pronunciation. Um, and they lost, Avio, uh, has lost two yeah, propellant like tanks that. out of the four necessary to power the fourth stage of the final Vega flight. Uh, so the final Vega flight was uh, planned to launch the Sentinel-2C satellite. So what happened is several months ago, um, the tanks were stored in uh, Avio's production department. Uh, which was undergoing some renovation. And during the renovation, somehow these tanks went missing. And later, they were found crushed in a landfill. Um, so as of right now, Avio does not have any way of acquiring new tanks for its final Vega flight. And uh, as all of the Vega production lines have been shutting down. So yeah, it's just kind of like, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really know what to say, to be honest. <laughs> it just sounds crazy. How do you how do you lose? I mean, you, you would imagine there's got to be some kind of asset tracking here, especially when it's part of the rocket, half of it at least. Uh, Alex, what do you know about this? What, what's going on here? Asset tracking? I mean, who cares, right? Tagging your hardware? Yeah, I mean, who needs these tanks? These don't, these don't look these, important to me. I, I would expect this from like SpaceX maybe, but from Avio, <laughs> like really? Oh, jeez. <laughs> But yeah, um, this is, the, I mean, it's it's sort of embarrassing. And now they're trying to, because this is the last big uh, rocket that they, were, that they were putting together. Um, the Vega C is going to take over all the flights because they still launched Vega C a few years ago and they sort of overlapped. They, they were trying to overlap. For once, you know, Air and Spas actually had an overlapping of uh, pre <laughs> preceding rockets and succeeding rockets for once. Um, and the problem is, Vegasy is right now on a whole other sorts of issues with failures, uh, trying to fix them. And now this uh, Vega rocket was the last one that they were planning to launch in, in spring of next year. The issue is, as uh, Trevor mentioned, now they don't have a tank for the Avum upper stage, the, the sort of liquid uh, upper stage that they have for the final orbit insertion. And so right now it's, what do we do? And I think two of the things that they're trying to get to is either uh, just cancel the mission and fly it on a Vega C, try to wait out for one once Vega C is, is back. And the other option I think was that they were trying to look at taking the improved Avum stage, the fourth stage of the Vega C rocket, uh, and put it on the regular Vega. Now, it's a bit weird, but it's not totally out of the question to do that. It's, it's a bit complicated because I think the interface has changed when they improved to the to the Vega C, the, the improved Avum. I think they call it the Avum Plus or something like that. Um, so in theory, they could put the upgrade Four stage from the Vega C on the Vega uh, regular rocket, but man, that would be quite a, quite a weird thing <laughs> just because they lost the tanks. This is very complicated and they don't make the tanks anymore. So what do you do, right? Yeah. So, so they can either hobble something together, which I would imagine Trevor would have its own risk, right? If you kind of create a new rocket out of this that's never flown before, that's, that's gotta be a little risky. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> frankly, Vega has, not had the best history anyway. Um, I believe it was, yeah, in 2022, almost exactly a year ago, uh, Vega C had a failure um, on the Pilates Neo 5 mission. Uh, and then I had like two almost back to back failures in 2019 and 2020. It was a failure, a success, and then another failure. Both um, with Spanish satellites, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I don't know. The, the European space program right now, it, it seems like it's kind of in some desperate need of uh, some serious competition to replace some of these legacy aero makers. And, you know, there's hope with that with companies like RFA, uh, uh, POD Space and the other ones that we've talked about. I think last week's uh, show, we talked a good amount about some of the upcoming European launchers. But the ones that they have right now are 
just just not impressive with all of these failures that they've been having, whether it's losing tanks or losing payloads right, or into the ocean. And right. either they fail, they're failing when they go up, or they just lose the the components, and that's another failure too. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, musical There's... wolves here suggested, by the way, air tags. Maybe that would have so solved the problem. <laughs> Twenty nine dollars, yeah. and you're and you're you're Probably. done, right? Uh, there's another thing that I just thought about um, as a consequence, because if, if they move the, so the Vega, uh, the regular Vega had one launch left, but also the Vega C rocket also has its sort of like, ever since they started with Vega C, because when it started was around the same time, when, when it started, I mean the first launch, um, it was right around the time when, you know, there was the whole thing with Russia and Ukraine, uh, the war and everything. The problem is the Avum upper stage, the engine is produced in Ukraine. If I'm not fumbling at that, like I think it's it's the the right location. And so the thing is, the Avum Plus upper stage for the Vegacy um, rocket, I think they already have like a batch of those engines and they could launch all the way to 2025, 2026. And that's when they want to launch the Vega E rocket, which is a whole nother different kind of uh, rocket with a Methalox upper stage C or Methalox. <laughs> and so uh, the, if you move one of these Avum Plus upper stages to the regular Vega, that means it's one less Vega C rocket. So it's going to be one less launch and probably moves you know, the, the time when the Vega E rocket needs to be debuted, it's probably going to be a bit more more of a rush to get that, that up in, and running. So, yeah, there's like even consequences down the line because it's, it's right. like And they want to keep iterating their, their design, right? So you can't have one design stay as the rocket for too long because you got to retool to the next one. And uh, Aravil here, maybe Trevor can take this one. Uh, would it be easier or cheaper at this point to just re-manifest all the payload onto Vegas C? But it sounds like from what Alex is saying, they want to move to another revision again. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of cost, it would be almost certainly cheaper to, frankly, just move them over to Falcon 9. And, <laughs> you know, Falcon 9 definitely has the, um, it definitely has the launch cadence to allow them to, in their schedule. Right, they got the inventory, which is, which is launch slots is the inventory, and they've got plenty of it, which actually is a great segue to our next topic, which is the year in numbers. A um, couple things to talk about here. One is SpaceX is determined to get to 100 launches by the end of the year. By my Apple Watch here, with uh, no AirTag on it, but uh, we are right now at December 10th. There's still lots of days left in the, in the month here. Um, they can maybe get two of them out tomorrow. Um, but also, the number of launches this year uh, totaled 204, uh, which beat last year's um, launch total of 186. And that 204 is the entire world. And of course, SpaceX has a vast majority of them. But let me turn it over to Trevor first. You know, the world is getting a lot more competitive. You can, we, we kind of alluded to the fact that Europe might need some shaking up. Um, clearly, there's a business here. Otherwise, we wouldn't see all these launches going on. So what do you think, Trevor? Are we going to see double next year? Maybe a third more? Um, yeah, so I guess, first of all, I think it's important to clarify that I believe the numbers that we have for last year, those were just... Uh, include suborbital launches, uh, not just orbital ones. Because uh, according to Next Space Flight, uh, which is what I generally use, uh, last year had 174 orbital launches. And we are at, I believe, tomorrow's Falcon Heavy is going to be 203 this year. So no matter what, we're still significantly above what we were last year. Um, but I think before diving too much into the numbers, it's worth just kind of highlighting some of the cool things that we've seen this year. Uh, first of all, obviously, there was this like, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's this really big, steel, shiny rocket that launched twice. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah well, right? That's guaranteed excitement for, right? Yeah, that yeah something like that. Uh, that launched twice this year, which is frankly a pretty incredible place for the first year of a, um, it's not even an operational rocket. And the amount of uh, changes that were made between flights one and two and the improvement that we saw, it's amazing work by SpaceX's team as always. Um, then we had some exciting science missions this year. Uh, Euclid launched and Psyche launched. Um, both of those will be doing science and writing our, our textbooks for the coming decades. Um, 
then also we don't have footage of this, but North Korea had their first successful orbital launch this year, uh, which is certainly, I don't know if you would call it as exciting, uh, but it's still, you know, another country that's put something into orbit. Um, well, I think it was the third uh, overall, but it was that it was the first of the Cholima 1 rocket. Sure, yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, yeah, uh, which was a spy satellite that we think they put up there. <laughs> yeah, um, spy satellite. Yeah, that was like under 200 kilograms or something like that. So I, I don't think the U.S.'s uh, Department of Defense is going to be terribly worried. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Yeah, so then anyway, this year, as I said, we've seen uh, this week's launches will go up through, two, three, through 204 uh, after tomorrow's Falcon 9 launch. Um, so that's way above uh, 2022's 174. And 2022 uh, was the most launches out of any year ever with the uh, next most being like in the 1970s or something like that. So, uh, you know, after Soviet Union collapsed, we saw a lot of the launch, the launch cadence go way down. And then now it's slowly been picking up and uh, now we've been setting records every year. Uh, next year, we obviously expect even more of these uh, to happen, right? SpaceX themselves are planning 144 Falcon launches mm -hmm. next year, plus however many uh, Starship launches uh, on top of that, which Alex will get to here in a second. Um, yeah, this year, SpaceX has accounted for, I believe, on the order of like 45% of all orbital launches, which is just kind of mind blowing. It's crazy, and, and when you think about how busy we are here at NSF, just covering all these launches, just the ones from Florida, you know, it's like every other day they're doing something. You know, if you live in the Space Coast, it's oh, yeah. getting a lot of a lot of rumbling out there. Um, but we're Alex, you're going to hit 100. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I would say, you know, we, we, with SpaceX here, you know, hoping to maybe hit 100 this year. I mean, clearly, it's a it's a nice milestone to say, hey, we could do 100 a year. Does it matter? But do you think? And and if it does, do you think they're going to hit the number? Well, it's going to be a bit a bit complicated. I was actually pulling up here a conversation from yesterday uh, of how many Cape launches we've seen this year. It's been um, 60, 68, 68, yeah, there. Um, 64 from SpaceX, three from ULA, and one from Relativity. Uh, that's basically all of the launches from the Cape. That's going to be much larger number uh, next year, we believe. It's probably going to be crossing 100 launches from the Cape. The, the Cape Canaveral is going to be a very busy spaceport in the next few yeah. years, but definitely very interesting whether SpaceX overall can achieve 100 missions with Falcon. Now, it is true, though, that when Elon said, oh, we're, we're trying to achieve 100 launches, um, and people are like, well, that counts as Starship, but then Elon tweeted the, the, the other day, 91. And if you count all of the Falcon launches, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, you get 91. But if you count in uh, Starship, then you get 93 because you get two more. So obviously he's counting only Falcon, not Starship. Right. And it kind of looks like basically the whole company is just counting Falcon. So we need nine more launches in the next um, three weeks, right? That's basically three launches per week. It's complicated, but yeah, they may that's, that's, get that's kind there. of pushing it a little bit. They may get to like 97, 98, but you know, if they get close enough, then, then I would count. I mean, I, I would imagine Starship kind of counts. It did, it did launch to some degree. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm actually looking here through my, through my spreadsheet. And so we have the, the USSF 52 launch. We have the next Starlink mission from the Cape. <clears throat> we have another Starlink from Vandenberg on the 13th local, 14th UTC. And then we have the Ovson 3 satellite launching from the Cape after the Starlink mission. And that is gonna be, uh, well, sort of officially the 15th, but I'm gonna bet that it's gonna be delayed to, to the 16th because of this delay of, um, of this um, Starlink mission. And then after that, that will be five days from now, six days from now, more or less, so we got two weeks to launch, what, six launches? That's, again, three three or four launches per week. So that's going to yeah. be a, a really complicated feat. But yeah. there's, a, there's, there's a, an exception here. They may launch a Starlink from, from LC-39A. So you see the Falcon Heavy, right? Then they need to convert into a Falcon 9. They may launch a Starlink launch uh, before the end of the year. If they do that... They will, they will be able to have a lot of um, 
how to say it, uh, flexibility, because then um, right now they have already, the last launch from Vandenberg um, broke the, the turnaround time for that pad down to six and a half days, which means in the 21 days that we have of the year, they can still launch three more times and still have like a couple of days of leeway. We'll see, we'll see if it actually happens. Um, but oh man, that flight, uh, that, that, that video. I remember that one. Which one was <laughs> that a long time ago? Is that, is that the, the 100 launches, right? I think. Okay. Yeah, that, that was one of my first long format videos that I wrote. Got and it. so uh, we actually went into what is, what is the sort of turnaround time for each pad? And mm -hmm. what, is, what is the lowest that they are, have been able to, to get to? And back in 2022, I think the, the turnaround time for, for Slick 40 for Vandenberg was around 11 or 12 days, which was really good because that meant that they could launch about 30 times in terms of the amount of launches from Vandenberg. Guess what? There are now 27 launches, so they need three more launches to get to 30. I was more or less right on that one. Then Slick 40, they have been able to do, I think they are around 50 launches this year. I'm scrolling by here through a lot of information. Yeah. 52, uh, 52 launches from Slick 40, which I also sort of said that if they kept their average turnaround time to their record turnaround time in 2022, Right. Uh, if that was the sort of average in 2023, then they will be able to do more launches. And that's exactly what they have done. They have been able to do more than 50. I predicted about 50 uh, with that one. And, and they have been able to do that. LC39A was the one that was slacking this year, though, with less launches than last year. And, and the reason for that was mostly because of these transitions between Falcon Heavy and Falcon 9 and Falcon 9 with Dragon and things like that. It was a bit complicated, but also because of the limitations of the recovery assets in the, in, in the East Coast. We also talked talk about that on the 100 launches video that we did last year. Right, you gotta have where, those ships out there to catch the boosters, right? So you can't, if, you, if they're exactly. tied up, you, can't, you, can't, you, you don't wanna lose the booster. So you've got that. It seems like there's a mm -hmm. lot of logistics here that prevent the kind of cadence perhaps that they want to see. And I did get a question here and I could toss this one over to uh, Trevor. Uh, Bart Van Schoelenberg uh, was suggesting, well, maybe they could take over Slick 37 or maybe build another pad somewhere. Obviously building another pad and adding another drone ship to the fleet would probably help increase that, Trevor. Any, any buzz about that happening? Maybe they'll expand their operations a bit or maybe just build a bigger rocket that can send more up at a time. Yeah, so uh, this is almost certainly not going to happen. We've seen, um, right, SpaceX's current bottleneck is not with pads. It's uh, with recovery assets, as Alex was talking about. Uh, but at the end of this month, we're expecting them to work around that uh, bottleneck. And how do you do that? It's either <laughs> you get another drone ship or you do more RTLS missions. And uh, the answer that SpaceX is going with is they are going to perform return to launch site Starlink missions. So uh, starting with Starlink Group 6-35 and 6-36, uh, which are happening no earlier than later this month. Of course, it depends on you know how many missions they get off. Um, mm -hmm. Those both have return to launch site options. So it's very possible that we'll see a return to launch site Starlink this month, which is very exciting because now cape launches when you go down will get even more exciting since there's a much higher chance of you seeing a starlink mission um so with this now and that by the way the landings are really cool to see in person for sure <laughs> yeah i yeah. really want to go see one i went down to the cape when there were supposed to be three launches in the span of a week and of course every yep. single oh one i remember that one yeah yeah <laughs> it always happens whenever you book a flight it's uh, it's, it's killer and let yeah. me ask you this alex because um you know, when we're talking about the return to launch site, obviously there's, it, it's more challenging because you don't have as much fuel. Um, we saw, especially when uh, Crew-7 went up, um, those of us who were watching Crew-7 from the Kennedy Space Center were surprised by how short the landing or the initial uh, entry burn was. And it <laughs> well, seems like the, spe the speculation was that maybe they were experimenting with higher velocity landings. Is that something they've been doing to try to see what they can squeeze out of the hardware? I think after that we saw another RTLS with a with a it was a cargo dragon we was CRS twenty nine and that time around the reentry burn actually worked I think it was probably some kind of um, hiccup on the okay. on the entry burn or something like that because then we saw a normal 
Um, it was a still one engine uh, entry burn because they don't need that much of a, of a slowdown for RTLS. The good thing of the RTLS is that it comes back very slowly in the sense that it's not going through the through the atmosphere at 7,000 kilometers per hour. It's more around 4,500. 4, it's still a, a huge velocity, but it's much less right. velocity. And so it is able to go through with just one engine instead of three. And one of the things that, that you know, Trevor hit that, that I think is very important is that now they have this option where they may just do a Starlink where they just return back to the launch site. Now they are going to be able to they're not going to be able to launch as many satellites per launch, but by doing that, they are able to increase the cadence because now you can have a launch with a with a drone ship landing, one with a with a return to launch site, and then another with a drone ship landing. In between these drone ship landings, then you can have a return to launch site, and this is important because right now they are at the point of the drone ships on the east coast. They may be able to go down to seven days between launches with these uh, drone ships, but they are not able to do less than that. Whereas, so if you think about it, you will use one drone ship, right? Then you have another launch with the other drone ship. And now right. three and a half days later, you have the other launch. And so right. you have like a seven day turnaround between one single drone ship, but then you have another drone ship uh, mission in between. But with this, you can even fit another mission in between with an RTLS or right. even two missions with an RTLS in between. So now you can mix in two more missions where you can only have three. So you, you're effectively increasing the cadence and by, and, and by doing that, you're also increasing the overall amount of, of, of satellites that you're launching. Even though those RTLS missions, you are maybe launching 17 or 16 satellites instead of 23, right, you are still your able- still Right, your uh, net is still exactly. higher for the time you have. Exactly. Right? exactly. The overall so, is still launching more per per time. So it's it's an increase of the of the cadence of of launching these satellites. It's Starlink very valuable. Starlink flux will be increasing. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Got to keep that internet going for everybody. All right. Before we close this topic out, I think uh, this is a good opportunity for the two of you to to fight about whether or not they're going to hit the hundred. And I will uh, have Kevin cue the bell. And uh, once the bell rings here, um, we'll, we'll start off with Trevor. Where Trevor, is he? 100, yes or no? Here. He's over um, to your left. Yeah, to your right. Sorry. <laughs> counting Starship, yes. Not counting Starship, no. I think it's going to be very tight. And the fact that they had to push uh, the Starlink mission that was supposed to happen today back a day will probably hurt them. Um, yeah. And I, I'm saying no. All right. The yeah. answer is no. Alex. <laughs> it's I, I will say they're going to be very, very tight. If they meet their turn on times, maybe, but it's going to be hanging by a, by a very, very thin thread that could break very, very easily. If they have these sort of delays of one day, think about it. Uh, right now, they're launching at a rate of basically once every two days. Um, and so if you delay by a day, you're basically removing half a launch from your schedule. So if you do two of these delays, then you're removing a whole flight from your schedule. Or if, or if you have another launch that is really, really soon about to get into 2024, then you get to that point. And I'm going to propose one thing. Because right now, we are at a point where SpaceX may not care and launch on, on Christmas Day, right? Because usually they try to avoid that. They may launch on Christmas Day and, who knows, maybe on New Year's Eve. We'll see mm. that. Don't get my so hopes no holiday up. for uh, SpaceX folks there. That's 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 what it's that means. So, say. all right. So so Alex, fair to say maybe, and Trevor is a no. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see who won the fight in a couple days, a couple weeks here. We're almost uh, at the end of December. I think so the one last thing that we may want to say is SpaceX's VP of Launch tweeted, I believe uh, it was on the order of a week ago at this point, or, or posted on X that a um, hundred launches is achievable but it would require very hard work by the teams, as we've been saying, and also some good luck on weather. Um, so I think no matter what, even if SpaceX misses the goal, it is truly remarkable that they've even managed to come close to it. Uh, and I imagine next year, you know, the 144 launch goal with their cadence these last two months, last three months, doesn't even seem that unreasonable at this point, which is crazy to say. It's unbelievable. And you know what's fun is I have a bunch of people that I knew who used to live near me who all retired down at the Space Coast. And they have become like as, as crazy about this stuff as we are. 
Um, and they have so much, like every day I get a call, hey, they launched another one, I can't, this is so awesome. So uh, it, it just, it really is becoming like almost like watching planes take off from the airport at this point. It's just, uh, just amazing. But speaking of, of launch cadence and turnaround time, you know who's gonna do over 100 packages before the end of the holidays? The NASA Space Flight Store is gonna do that, and there's still time. So we've got a lot of great stuff at shop.nasaspaceflight.com for the space lover in your life, or you can get a gift card and have them pick out what they want. So the big thing is the mission patches for Flight Test 2 of Starship. This is high resolution embroidery. Look how beautiful this is. This was designed in-house by uh, one of our artists here. They look great. And you can put this on your jacket, put them on your shirt, put them on whatever. And we've got a bunch of other places you can get the logo stuck to. Water bottles, pillows, you name it. We've got a lot of great stuff. Also, metallic prints of launches. And our team is so fast that Starship had barely hit the ocean before our metal prints were available in the store. And these look beautiful. Um, so if you have somebody who is really hard to shop for, like me, um, these are great gift ideas because they're one of a kind, very unique, and very high quality. So if you are looking to, again, get your the space lever in your life some great gear, uh, check out shop.nasaspaceflight.com. They've got great shirts like the one I've got on here and all sorts of good stuff. So uh, check it out. And, and by the way, you can get a lot of this stuff before Christmas. So go ahead, Alex, what'd you say? <laughs> I was also going to say heavy. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You got the heavy, the heavy hoodie. We got, I love it. You got some heavy gear. It looks great. Show, show it it's again. It's cozy. It's cozy. It's really good. Look. Oh, it's beautiful. I, you know what? It's I, very I could simple. Use one of those, so, yes. Yeah. But it's heavy. That's awesome. We should get you so, that one. <laughs> and there's there's always new stuff. So check it out. Shop.nasaspaceflight.com. And I want to thank a couple. We have one more topic left, but before we do, I want to thank a few uh, folks in our support queue here. Uh, so Dan Yura, a new member, became a Padrat member. Alan P. gifted one red team membership, and we have an upgrade, uh, Mike Ahola, uh, upgraded to launch director. Thank you very much for that, and we welcome you aboard the launch director team, and H. Glenn 55 became a PADRAT member. So there you go. All right, our last topic is everybody's favorite topic. We, of course, have a show when we get close to one of these launches dedicated to this topic, and that, of course, is Starship. So we had... I think an a, a amazing test flight a couple of weeks ago where everything worked a lot better than it did the first time. I think beyond our expectations after we chatted after the launch. Um, what about the third mission? I'm sure SpaceX wants to get that, uh, that lot cleared out. They got a lot of rockets over there. Uh, could we see mm -hmm. one before the end of the year or do you think it's gonna be a little bit longer than that? I'll toss Hi. that to you, Alex. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was sort of like doing a, a no with my head. Um <laughs> no, I don't I don't think we're going to see a launch um in in what remains of this year. It will be very very wild. Um n not not just to get the the testing done by then, but also the regulatory side of things. Um I do think we may see some sort of testing this this year. Before the before the end of this year, basically, um, and the reason for that is because we have road closures for tonight from from Starbase. I think it is from the from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, Central, and so that could be so that road closure is a transport closure. That transport closure could be for either Booster 10 or Ship 28. It could be either of those. Ship 28 is you know as as the hours go by having less chances because uh, we will need to see ship 30 first going out of the high bay and then ship 28 also going out. But they may still have a few more hours to, you know, of, of margin to do all of that movement. And also the, the road closure is four hours long. So it's, it's nice. Um, it's long enough probably to be able to do that. And if not, they may be able to, you know, roll it out at a later point. But either way, we're probably cl uh, very, very close to that point of having uh, testing back at the launch site, either from Ship 28 or Booster 10. And not only we have had testing uh, in, in the horizon, but we also have a lot of upgrades that they have been doing with a, with a tank farm, uh, installing all of the other pumps and subcoolers that they, that they put there uh, before the second flight, but they hadn't um, plugged in. Now they're plugging them in and trying to close that out. Um, they have also brought new tanks, at least five of them. I think four of them are on their pedestals and the five is a little bit 
up in the air. I don't. I haven't really looked it up to be honest. Uh, they didn't I'm, lose any I, of them. I, those those tanks are yeah. all accounted for, right? <clears throat> I I care more about the the subcoolers and pumps and things like that than the new tanks because it's it's it seems like they're getting there. Maybe they'll they'll hook them up for the third flight, but I'm not fully sure they're gonna use them for the third flight. It seems like they're taking it a little bit more lightly. Now on that page on Nexus Space Flight, one of the problems that we have there is that it takes the data from the from the um it, it takes the data from the from the website but one of the problems with the website is that the document says 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. and then the website itself says 12 p.m. to 2 a.m. which is a really long closure that is obviously not the case it's actually 10 p.m. from 2 a.m. per the document so it's a transport closure of 4 hours we think that's probably going to be either booster 10 or chip 28 chip 28 again you know the chances are going down as they are not clearing the high bay and things like that for it to to come out but we'll see just keep an eye on starbase live and definitely very very interesting because we're going to get testing soon either from the suburban side or the olm can i Trevor, just note the, uh, that i'm sorry Trevor. yep go ahead. yeah i just wanted to note about those uh road closures this is the perfect example of why 12 hour time is horrible it's just so confusing when you have this 12 p.m and that's not the middle of the night and we should just all use 24 hours Please continue on. <laughs> That's okay. I was gonna. I was gonna ask you. Yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, we gotta make gotta make sense. And imagine if you lived there, trying to make sense of all that. Um, so we all, we had, I think, just with hours after the launch of the second uh, test flight, uh, the FAA saying, saying that they have opened a mishap investigation, which I, I know uh, some space fans out there started rolling their eyes. But that that Trevor still has to happen, right? We still have to determine what caused things not to happen as they were supposed to. Yeah, that's correct. So just like the process that we saw after flight one, how this will work is SpaceX will uh, lead the report. Uh, so they'll come up with a list of items that failed during uh, IFT2 and a list of corrective items uh, that they're going to make on IFT3 and future flights to ensure these failure modes don't happen again. Um, the good news is, you know, I'm sure the list after this launch will be way, way shorter than the list after the first launch. Uh, but that's still something that the uh, SpaceX needs, needs to submit to the FAA. Then the FAA will need to say, yes, we agree to these items, and then uh, sign off on it after that. Uh, the good news, though, is, like I said, it should be way fewer items. And also, uh, since the deluge system worked so well uh, that time on the last launch, we are not expecting that SpaceX to make any changes to it, meaning that the Fish and Wildlife's report uh, that they filed is still applies to the next launch. Um, so the whole process still needs to be done, but it should be significantly quicker ahead of this next flight. Uh, the good, the also somewhat good news is uh, since it's in SpaceX's hands right now, you know, they can work over holidays or what if they want when the government will be shut it down on those days and would not be working. So hopefully by the time the government is open again after New Year's, uh, SpaceX will have a report ready to hand over um, for the FAA to start saying, deciding if they agree with what other changes they want and whatnot. Right, I think we'll see those changes getting smaller and smaller with each, uh, each launch attempt here. And certainly when we get to a successful launch, that will uh, speed things up even more. Um, Alex, let me ask you this. Musical Wolves was saying, is, is there any noticeable changes to the ship that we'll see on the pad next? Oh, well, there's, there's certainly some changes. Uh, you'll see that it has... New Starlink antennas on the nose cone, for example, it'll have uh, new hardware there. It also includes a lot of more uh, upgrades to the structure. Uh, the tanks have more stringers compared to Ship 25. That was actually a thing that was already introduced with Ship 26. Uh, you can see it there in the middle of all of those vehicles in the Rocket Garden. Um, but definitely, you will see some differences. Now, you will need to look carefully at the vehicle, obviously, for some of these differences. But then other things that are not going to be visual, but we'll, we know that they are present, is, for example, the electric TVC that was not present on Ship 25. It was present on Booster 9, but not on the ship. So now we're going to have Ship 28 having that the, the electrical TVC, the electrical gimbaling system, and also uh, Booster 10. Booster 10 has been moved to the Rocket Garden in the last week. We have seen it being put on the new fancy transporter uh, stand that they have uh, designed for, for the boosters. And now it is sitting there on the Rocket Garden. It is not to be alarmed though. A lot of people mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, when whenever something rolls out to the Rocket Garden, they already write it off as being dead because usually that's the last resting place of of any vehicle that's going to be scrapped. Uh, but um, but now with it might Booster be, Nine might be storage, they they've been cranking them out, right? Like mm -hmm. they, they they're running out of room. With Booster Nine, for example, with with that booster, they also uh, rolled it out to the to the pad. Uh, excuse me, for uh, to to Rocket Garden before rolling out to the pad. Excuse me, and so um, we th we think that the reason they might have moved this is maybe because they're reconfiguring the engine stand where this booster was located. So this is this is funny because nowadays. Um, it's very unlikely that they have a rush for space because they're stopping the booster production because they have this V2, right? Uh, version two of a Starship, both for the ship. And we also believe that it's probably also going to be for the booster because both the booster and the ship have stopped production. So no new ships are being built. No new boosters have been gone through production for a while as well. Uh, booster 13 is sort of halfway in, in the stacking process. And the other only booster that could use the same engine stand as uh, Booster 10 is Booster 12. And the thing with Booster 12 is it hasn't even done cryogenic testing. We will have expected already that booster to have gone through cryogenic testing at masses. So I don't think it was this time around a problem of a space, but more of a let's get it out and just do other stuff. That's my total guess. Got it. And Trevor, I've been hearing about this, this fuel transfer experiment that NASA wants to do on the next flight. Uh, clearly, there's some optimism that they're going to get this thing into orbit where they can do this test. What can you tell us about the plan for this? Because obviously, this is to replicate moving fuel in orbit, which they would have to do for Artemis III. Uh, but they're not going to have a second Starship up there. So how are they going to do this in a test environment? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we're not going to see two very rapid Starship launches um, on this flight. Uh, so what we're expecting uh, is for the flight profile to be pretty similar to the one that we saw on this flight, where it'll just have that little bit of time uh, in orbit in orbit before reentry. Um, and w additionally, since there is no vehicle and we haven't seen any other uh, hardware being installed on Ship 28, we're expecting this to be a transfer between the header tanks and the main tanks. Um, so we're not entirely sure what that process would look like, but it would probably involve using the um, ullage gas uh, to apply a force to the vehicle to help push some propellant uh, from one tank to the other. We don't know which direction it would be or whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's it's super exciting that you know we kind of thought I believe on a show about two weeks ago we were uh, we were talking about how SpaceX hasn't really made any progress on this front yet. And then now NASA comes out and says that on the next flight, they're hoping to uh, demonstrate something. So I'll, I think clearly there's a very big gap between successfully uh, transferring fuel between the header tanks and the main tanks on orbit and transferring an entire load of fuel between uh, main tanks to main tanks. Uh, but no matter what, it's progress and uh, it's exciting that SpaceX is already starting to think about these things because as we were talking about two weeks ago, this is crucial for the second, uh, for uh, the Artemis program and frankly for Starship in general. And Alex, do you think next year we're going to see a, just a much higher cadence of launches now that a, a lot of the big regulatory stuff is out of the way? Well, um, there's, there's two things there, one from the vehicle side and launch pad side. And then the other side is the regulatory side. So from the vehicle side is they're going to be doing now the whole um, B2, you know, version two of a Starship and everything. So they may slow down in the transition point, maybe because they need to upgrade, for example, the pad or, or things like that. We don't really know um, whether that's going to be a thing or not. We also are seeing preparations for a second tower at, at, at Starbase. So they may also uh, use that transition to be able to build up the second launch pad. We, again, we don't really know uh, fully what's going to happen with that, but definitely some potential for, how to say it, um, for, for things to delay, so to speak, right? For chaos to ensue and, and things like <laughs> that. Now, I do think it's not going to be um, a huge increase in cadence. I, I think we may see 
five launches at most next year of a starship and the thing that i'm looking forward the most is them returning back to work on 39a and building that second launch tower at starbase because that will mean that perhaps by the end of 2024 we might have three launch sites for starship and that's when it gets exciting because then they can test all of these uh test you know these things of docking two ships together and and doing the whole refueling instead of being within one ship and trans porting one tank from the other and things like that. The real deal will be when two of them launch within a few hours of each other or maybe within a day or so, and then we have uh, that docking in space. That's when it gets more exciting. And I think once they get at least those three pads up and running, they could go into that into that whole mindset of let's launch a lot of times, let's just you know do all of this testing for HLS and be able to to go ahead with it. I'll tell you what, I think we are going to be very busy here at NSF covering all of this because it's going to get progressively more exciting, right? I mean, the launches are exciting enough, but imagine a launch, a docking, a landing, um, all of this stuff is going to have to happen uh, ahead of Artemis 3, and it's going to have to happen well ahead of Artemis 3 in order for all of this to uh, come together and work. And so we'll keep an eye on it, right, Alex? Yeah, and, and one last thing is that once they change the profile of these of these missions, we're also going to see new paperwork because the current launch license, for example, um, it is true that it is currently only for the second flight because it has, we've talked about it many, many times, that it has that sort of um, condition of for the second flight only unless it is uh, amended or something like that. But the rest of the conditions are for a flight that is a suburban flight going from 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 Starbase all the way across and splashing down in Hawaii. If they want to do other sorts of things in orbit and do other sorts of you know, missions, then that launch license will see a modification. And also, if those other missions affect the environment, for example, then you get the involvement of the Fish and Wildlife Service. That's why I think the next launch might be just pretty much the same as the previous two, but this time actually getting the ship all the way to Hawaii Cross our fingers that actually happens. Right. I'm really hoping that happens. But uh, definitely, you know, regulatory side of things might change as well. Hawaii or bust, as they say. So there you go. Um, so we've got a couple more super chats to acknowledge here as we begin to uh, wind things down from the show. Very informative, as always. I love being on with you two because I learn a lot. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, JK Video for your super chat. And we have a related question here from Andrew Kirkpatrick. And maybe I'll toss this one over to Trevor. Um, will there always be a need for a second stage or could there be enough fuel left over in the booster for the fuel transfer? A silly question, maybe. Well, I guess the problem is you got a lot of weight that you got to get into orbit and that fuel is heavy, Trevor, right? Sorry, I was muted. Um, <laughs> so there are kind of two problems with this. First of all, the booster is on a suborbital trajectory. Uh, so that means that, um, you know, it's not actually going to orbit to transfer propellant. And then the other way, thing is the way that the booster kind of works is they take the amount of propellant they need for landing, and then they burn all of the propellant in the booster minus that amount. Uh, so that's going to include for the boost back burn, for the landing burn, and then any resi uh, residual propellant that you need in the tanks. Um, so the booster should be like pretty close to being dry by the time it lands. Uh, and then all of that energy goes into Starship, and then Starship is the one that will actually have ex leftover propellant uh, for a fuel transfer. So really it's about getting to, to Starship to where it needs to be, where its fuel can get it further, right? So that's why that booster yeah. is so important. Um, so we got a couple more uh, Super Chats and members to thank. We have uh, Janine and Carl, who became a new PadRat member. Thank you very much for that. And also Nova1861, who became a Red Team member. So thank you very much for your support. I want to thank uh, the members, all of you, uh, who contribute to the efforts that we make here on the channel because it is vital for keeping this coverage going. We've got cameras now all over the place. And as the cadence increases, uh, we certainly uh, thank you very much for helping us maintain all the infrastructure that uh, we have here. So 
lots of stuff going on around space here. So thank you very much for your support of that. I also want to thank uh, Kevin and Jay, our production team, for keeping the show on the air today. It's amazing the amount of engineering that they uh, do there. And I also want to thank uh, both you, Alex, and you, Trevor, uh, for coming on today as well. Any final words from, uh, from both of you? Alex, we'll start with you. Well, I, I was going to say that, um, I don't know. I have a, a, a good a good time here. Uh, I had all of these things prepared for, for Kevin to show, but he saw all of my spreadsheets and he was like, ooh, no, because <laughs> we're going to scare people. But uh, yeah, definitely very, very interesting. And we'll see if SpaceX actually reaches 100 uh, launches this year with Falcon. And Definitely look for, look out for you know potential roll rollouts in in the near future. Um, you know we have that closure tonight. We'll see if that happens. All right, Trevor. Any last words? Yeah, and it's not only those closures. The NSF team will be busy with lots of other stuff for you guys. Right tomorrow we got the marathon stream for uh, Falcon Heavy and Falcon Nine. Um, hope going toward that hundred launch goal, and then. You know, any Starship testing that happens during the week, you know that we'll be live. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in and, you know, being interested in what we have to say. And we'll be here. And if something moves on that launch site, we're going to come and cover it live. So be, be able to be ready for that. Um, and we'll be back next week. There's going to be a new show, I hear, uh, from Adrian Bell as well. So I don't even know what that is, but we'll find out soon enough. So if you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button at a minimum so you can keep in the loop on uh, what we are up to here. So, uh, but thank you all for tuning in. It's great to be back uh, covering things. I have been like coughing since the launch of Starship. I'm getting better, so I appreciate everybody sticking with me here. I'll be back to a uh, full, uh, full thrust here in a couple of days, but I <laughs> uh, thank you all for, for tuning in. And I greatly appreciate everyone's support of everything that's done here. And I really appreciate everybody that works so hard I'm bringing this coverage to you because we are really entering the future now and it's ex incredibly exciting to be covering this uh, for all of you. So until next time, this is Lon Seidman on behalf of NSF. Thank you all for watching and uh, stay tuned for a lot more. And we'll uh, now turn you over to some live shots from Starbase in Texas. And here we go. Yeah, chamber pressure looks good. Well, we know.